Today there will be only one group of the tutorial. It will be all in age 45, so whoever is usually going to the seminar room, please also go to age 45. It will be German tutorial for a change. Uh, and please, as we said last time, prepare a little more so that it is more a joint effort in the tutorial. It should not be another lecture given by me, and it simply should help you to be ready for exams and actually to work with the material we are presenting here to you. Okay, so welcome to today's lecture six. We are going to talk about organoboron and organosilicon compounds. We will do this relatively briefly, although these two types of organometallic reagents are extremely important in synthesis. And then we will move on to some enolate chemistry. Now, Let's start with the organoboron. And you have already, in the first organic lecture you ever had, you have encountered organoboron compounds. And that is one of the reasons they are so useful uh, because they are quite easy to prepare. And the most common way to prepare organoborin is by hydroboration. of alkenes or alkynes. Very facile reaction. Principle, you have an unsaturated system. You have a borane, which has at least one hydrogen boron bond, and in a syn addition, meaning the boron and the hydrogen fragment adds from the same phase of the alkene, and in a more or less concerted reaction, where bond forming and breaking here of the double bond not necessarily has to go at the same, in the same concerted way, it might still be asynchronous. But still, the bond forming and reorganization processes more or less happen at the, at the same time. And for stereoelectronic and also for steric reasons, the boron fragment usually goes to the sterically less hindered side of the alkene. The hydrogen is delivered to the stereochemically more hindered alkene. Stereoelectronics, you can understand if initially the bond formation between the carbon and the boron fragment has taken further, has, has, is more advanced than the hydrogen carbon formation here. Therefore, some kind of positive charge is developing in the transition state, uh, making the positive charge on the more substituted side of the double bond more favorable. So then we have a syn addition. To obtain such boranes, the one reaction you know very well how you can work up such alkyl boranes are this hydrogen peroxide which will allow you to introduce a uh, an hydroxyl group here. But there are other ways to work up uh, boron compounds. We will see later on that you can do 
palladium type cross coupling chemistry. This will be a separate lecture towards the end of the semester where you can actually introduce other carbon substituents. There is the possibility to introduce halogens and bromosokinimid, for example. Which will allow you to introduce halides. Now there is a great number of boron reagents one can use for this uh, type of Hydroborations in the most easiest way, or the most simple reagent, most difficult to handle is probably boron itself, because boron is uh, is a gas. However, you can stabilize it as a dimethyl sulfide adduct, and this way you can handle it quite well. Another very popular. Reagent is catechol borane. Which is stable, readily available, and once you deliver the boron fragment to an alkene or so, you will selectively cleave the boron carbon bond, and there's no chemistry going on by cleaving of this type of the, of the aromatic substituent. And another boron reagent is the salt called 9BBN. This is the nine bora by cyclononane. This is very, very popular because it is, again, highly reactive. Reacts with all types of alkenes. However, again, once you have introduced a carbon fragment here, when you do the workup, or cross-coupling reactions, the bicyclic, the chelating ligand, will not transfer into a product. It will only be this type of, uh, the, the, the newly formed boron alkyl fragment here will undergo cross-coupling or other reactions. The reason this looks, in the first moment, probably a little bit funny. The question is, uh, is that easily prepared? And indeed it is. You can prepare it. in one step from 1,5-cyclooctadiene, readily available industrial product. And all you have to do is treat this with boron. And then the hydroboration takes place. on these two carbon atoms here. And therefore, this will exactly give you the structure you see here. So therefore, this is readily available, very useful, uh, easy to handle, highly reactive in these type of uh, hydroboration reactions. So another example is the hydroboration of alkynes. This works equally well. Let's give 
give an example with Catahol Borane. So again, cis reaction, cis addition. will lead to the cis alkene here. Now, of course, if these two substituents are similar in size, you will have problems of regal selectivity only when these two substituents are sufficiently differentiated in size. Then, again, the Born fragment will attack on the smaller side of the alkyne and the hydrogen is delivered to the larger side. And again here, number of ways to do the workup, hydrogen peroxide will lead initially to the enol ether. which will lead to its tautomer, the carbonyl compound. So you can see the hydroboration of alkynes eventually gives a new uh, ketone here. You can also do an acidic workup where you will do a substitution against the proton. Now, this is very often not so useful, but sometimes more useful is it if you need to introduce a deuterium label selectively into your product. So taking a deuterated acid will allow you to do this. And again, halogenation is possible, for example, with NBS. to give you such vinyl bromides. And again, no, it's now, of course, stereoselective. You have all three substituents placed uh, in a controlled way. And we have talked when we covered alkyl lithium, alkyl magnesium compounds, cuprates, how useful such vinyl halides are for further coupling uh, reactions. Now, this is not the hydroboration of alkenes or alkynes. It's not the only way to make such boron compounds. Equally important is the transmetallation strategy, which is particularly useful for aryl substituted boron compounds. Again, let me give you an example. Sometimes it's not easy to functionalize aromatic compounds when they are strongly electron deficient, like such aerofluorine compounds. So what was attempted here was a methylation assisted by the chelating ability of the halogen atom. Metallation takes here place, but in principle, any type of aryl lithium compound will do the same chemistry. And now, trapping with this trimethyl borate here.
will allow you to introduce the Born fragment here. And the useful compound to, to work with are not the uh, boronic esters here. These are the boronic acids. So acid hydrolysis And this shows you also that such aryl boron compounds are quite stable, that they tolerate aqueous HCl, will lead here to a boronic acid. And again, these boronic acids have been proven to be extremely useful probably widely, most widely used in industry, again, are palladium-type cross-coupling reactions, the so-called Suzuki coupling. And again, we will cover palladium coupling reactions in a different lecture to learn how this works and what the scope is. But it's an extremely good way to functionalize aromatic compounds. And because of this reaction, this is uh, widely used in industry, such boronic acids are commercially available in large quantities and in many different derivatives. I believe that there are more than 100 or maybe even more substituted boronic acids commercially available. But again, also such boronic acids you can work up in the usual way, you do this of a, like you would work up a hydroboration. And this allows you to synthesize the corresponding phenols. And you will remember that there are not so many methods to introduce a hydroxyl group into an aromatic system. The hook hook phenol synthesis was one example, the Sandmeyer reaction, where you take a diazonium cation and uh, hydrolyze it with base is another way to do this. And again, halogenation is possible. which will allow you to introduce a halogen atom into an aromatic system. And again, it's a complementary way to do electrophilic substitutions. If you would have tried to brominate this difluoroaromatic compound directly with bromine and a Lewis acid catalyst, you would have probably not gotten a very good yield because this aromatic system is so desactivated, deactivated, that it will not readily undergo uh, electrophilic substitution reacting itself as a nucleophile. Now another class of compounds which is synthetically very useful are allyl boranes. And there is a, also a number of ways to make these compounds. I will just introduce one here. The normal way is that you have to be able to make somehow a L metal species. And we had seen a number of this. We have seen how you make how you can make L grignards uh, or by uh, using starting from L halides, uh, and that's useful starting material. I've taken another 
uh, example here, which also has become important, that you can even deprotonate with strong bases an alkene directly, like 2-butene here, you can deprotonate by using a mixture of n-butyl lithium and potassium t-butoxide. Supposedly, this will make butyl potassium in situ. This is an extremely strong, uh, strong base, which became known as the Schlosser base. And this will even be able to deprotonate an unfunctionalized uh, system like butene here. And then if you treat this With a uh, boron ester, you can introduce the boron fragment here. In this way, getting an L borane because it has an additional methyl group here. This is the so-called crotal borane. And because in this way it is Z configurated, so this is the Z crotal borane. And analogously, starting from the trans 2 butene. you can prepare the analogous uh, trans compound here. Now, the borings I have drawn here on the board, they are both thermally stable and you can isolate them at room temperature. However, for L borings, this is not self-evident and it is known L borings might undergo isomerization quite easily. By shifting the boron fragment, from the one to the three position, doing an allylic rearrangement, And so you can have the boring fragment at different positions in the carbon frame, but also <coughs> via this mechanism in Z to E isomerization can quite easily take place. It has been shown that If you have 
the ability to do this type of isomerization is very much depending on the nature of these R groups here. And so it was shown that if R is alkyl, these are the so-called crotal dialkyl boranes, that then this rearrangement occurs most easily If you have one alkyl and one alkoxy substituent, these are the so-called crotal alkyl borinates. that the tendency to rearrange is already lessened. And now I've trapped myself here. If you have two alkoxy substituents, going to the boronates, that then the tendency to rearrange is lowest. And so that's the reason why this crotal boronate I've written up here, which we, uh, which we have synthesized in the way that we already have two alkoxy groups in there, that this is terminally stable towards these type of isomerization reactions at room temperature. Now such L boring compounds are ex excellent equivalents for an L anion. And so as we will see in a moment, they readily will react with carbonyl compounds in a way that the boron having still one coordination site open will coordinate with such an, with a carbonyl compound. And then the L fragment here will attack the carbonyl group. And as you can immediately see here from the drawing I made, that this is again a reaction which goes through a six-member transition state. It's a reaction where three bonds will reorganize, this bond will break, this double bond will attack the carbonyl group, and the double bond here will coordinate with the boron, ultimately. So six electron reorganization aromatic transition state, and therefore such reactions are very facile and 
go very easy. Now, it has been shown that a very successful model to describe such kind of reactions from the stereochemical point of view is to uh, look at the transition state in a chair type geometry because as we know, six membered ring with saturated cis uh, carbon centers, the most stable conformation is the chair. And this had led So the so-called Zimmerman-Trexler model, this model is being applied for many more reactions. We will see this again in aldol reactions. We will see this in sigma-tropic rearrangements so quite a number of times. But the principle is always the same. You look at the, you look at the reaction by analyzing a chair type transition state. And so let's do this here. If I orient the six atoms I have, into a chair. And this would be the initial geometry which is fixed. I have, since I'm starting in my example here with an E configurated L borane, I have to draw the geometry of this alkyl L borane E configurated. However, now with my aldehyde, I have a choice. The aldehyde has two different substituents on the carbonyl group. One is probably larger. If it's, a, if it's an aldehyde, hydrogen is small. An alkyl group, aryl group will be larger than this. And the model which describes this very successfully is that you place this R group in the equatorial position and the smaller substituent, in this case the hydrogen, you will place it into the axial position. And so this way, if you Then connect the centers and analyze the stereochemistry which comes out of this. You should come to the conclusion that you are forming the anti-diastereomer. And I would strongly encourage you to try at home to work this through and see that indeed you are getting this diastereomer out which I have drawn here. And if not, then let's discuss this in the tutorial if you have problems to basically relate from a, such a transition state to such a product, which takes some practice. And that's also why I'm not showing this here, because everybody has to, to look at this yourself if you can, can redraw and reorient the stereo centers correctly. But if you have trouble with this, this is something we can discuss in the tutorial. Now, by the same analysis, if you would start with a Z-configurated L borane here. And the analysis runs analogous here. So again, chair typed transition state 
on the aldehyde side, R group in the equatorial position. However, now I have to be careful that I draw the Z configuration in here correctly. So this methyl group has to go down, has to be on the same side like the uh, boron substituent. And so this way, you are forming the syndiastereomer. And so therefore, the geometry you start with in the L-borane will transform in the two newly formed stereocenters here, giving you either the syn or the anti-stereoisomer. Uh, and so such reactions are called stereospecific, meaning that the E compound will selectively give you only one diastereomere, while the Z compound will give you the other one. Now, why are such reactions so important? The reason for this is that you can easily transform them, for example, by ozonolysis and the reductive workup into aldol compounds. So this is an aldol here. And nature has built up extensively natural products which will have alternating fragments where you have one serious center with an hydroxyl group and one serious center within, with a methyl group. And so basically, you can see here that you can do the same sequence because now you regenerate your aldehyde. You can do this again. So basically build up by doing this sequence every time again, and moreover, by choosing the E or the Z uh, L, L compound, you can influence here syn or anti, anti diastereochemistry. chemistry. You can build up these type of structural elements, which are, as I said, found abundantly in many natural products and also which are found in many pharmaceuticals. A lot of the antibiotics which are out there today, macrolactone antibiotics you, you buy, exactly contain such type of uh, fragments. And so therefore, the allylation ozonolysis is a very good alternative to the direct aldol reaction. And this is a reaction we will also cover uh, next, uh, fr this Friday quite in detail, so we have two very good methods to do this. And again, this is not only done in academic laboratories on small scale, industry in the synthesis of pharmaceuticals is carrying out such reactions on multi-kilogram scales without any problems. So it's very relevant to actual industrial synthesis. Now, if you look at this here, we have, I believe, understood how we can control the two stereocenters in a relative way. We have understood how we can either make the anti or the syn diastereomer. But note, of course, that this is produced here as a racemate. So the other anti enantiomer here is simply forming, again, something you might want to try if you put the aldehyde group back and bring the L fragment in front, so if you mirror this chair here, you're con you're, you should conclude then that you will form the other enantiomer. So in order to also control the absolute stereochemistry, meaning that you will only form 
one of the two possible enantiomers here, you have to introduce somehow chiral information. And I will not go much into detail into this, but the way to do this is if you, if you think about introducing chiral information into your borane, then either you can have the groups here in your borane can bear the uh, chiral information. And sometimes in one of these examples we had in the tutorials, you can also have a stereocenter already here. And then the chirality of your L borane will be transported in your product as well. And, and again, we have a problem in, in this regard in the tutorial. However, the most flexible way, of course, is to have chiral information in your icoxy groups. And there are many ways to do this. Just to give you one very useful type of L boranes, which have been synthesized. are these types of borates. And you can easily see how the serochemistry from what kind of starting material these come from. So the chiral auxiliary you're using here comes from tartaric acid. Readily available in both enantiomeric forms, being inexpensive. And if you introduce this into your L borane, you have chiral information here. And I'm not going into the models now how that chirality of the auxiliary is controlling the absolute stereochemistry here. And this is not so obvious, uh, the models which were put forward here, but it works very, very well. These type of reagents were developed by Professor Bill Rausch, who's currently heading the Scripps Institute, the new one which was built in Florida. And he has shown in many very nice examples the power of such reagents. And as I say, always important is that if you do these type of, if you synthesize such type of reagents, you need to have an auxiliary which is readily available and ideally in both enantiomeric forms so that you have the flexibility to use either one to access either of these type of uh, enantiomers here.
So let's move to another type of allyl reagents. Let's move to organosilicon compounds, and I will only cover allyl silanes, because again, arguably, we, they are the most important reagents. However, there's a lot of other chemistry with silanes. There is very interesting chemistry with vinyl silanes or alkyne silanes. So this is clearly not exclusive. However, what is very attractive on the allyl silanes are two features. The one feature is that L silanes are in difference to what we just learned on L boranes. L silanes are completely stable towards rearrangement reaction. So no so no one three shifts. as we have just discussed, uh, will occur. The other thing what is nice about them is that they are very easy to prepare. In principle, you use the same strategy as we already discussed with the L boranes. However, here it is even easier. What you can do is, again, you go through the Grignard uh, compounds, you make an L metal. However, what you can have already within your reaction flask is you can add trimethylsilyl chloride at low temperatures. Magnesium and trimethylsilyl chloride will not react with each other. Magnesium selectively will form the L magnesium compound, and then the L Grignard will trap the trimethylsilyl chloride. And so this way you're forming these type of reagents very easily. However, note that if you have an unsymmetrical L compound, as I have shown here, in principle, your L Grignard could react on both carbon centers. And so if they are unsymmetrical, then they have to be sterically differentiated like the example I've chosen here, reaction takes place exclusively on the less hindered uh, carbon rather than on the more sterically hindered carbon in order to have a Riga selective reaction. And so again, Two more possibilities. The reaction I already showed you for the preparation of the L boranes also works for the silanes. So again, especially important, the crotal case where you take two butene, you make the potassium anion here. and trapping this with trimethylsilyl chloride. will lead to the l silane here. And there are other ways. You can even prepare l silanes by Wittig technology, choosing an appropriate Wittig reagent, so this Wittig reagent here can be uh, prepared and then this way you can also build up an L silane here. All these type of reactions work very well. Quite a number of L silanes are also commercially available. 
So these are quite good uh, quite good reagents. And again, they are very good equivalents for for L anions. And so you can carry out typically a, again a, an allylation using an L silin and carbonyl compound, an aldehyde mostly, and what you have to use is you have to use a Lewis acid. Two most common Lewis acids which are used are titanium tetrachloride or boron trifluoride. And then if you react this with the L-silane, you will create a the allylated compound. And the interesting feature here is that no matter if you start from the E or the Z L-silin, in both cases, you will get, with good preference, the syn diastereomer. And so this should tell you something immediately. This should tell you that probably the mechanism has to be different. Because if it would be the same Zimmerman-Trexler type transition state as we have discussed uh, for the L-borines, the difference in geometry should be reflected in, the, in a different diastereomer. And obviously, this is not the case. Could have been gone through a Zimmermann tribe transition state. What would you have to do? You have, then you would have to coordinate the tetra-bound uh, silicon here within, with your carbonyl group, so make penta-coordinated silicon. So yes, in principle, silicon can be pentavalent. It would have been possible. And it has been shown that the analogous trichlorosilanes which are not quite as much used as the trimethyl xylenes, that they indeed follow a Zimmermann-Trexler transition state analogously to the L borines, but that the trialkyl silane, the trialkyl L silanes will form, will follow a different mechanism, which we will discuss now. And so what is this believed is that these reactions go by a stepwise addition where initially you activate with your Lewis acid your carbonyl compound.
And now in A, addition step, the L silane will react as a nucleophile and will attack the activated carbonyl compound. The regiostatictivity or the regiochemistry which is occurring here is, in this type of case, you might argue that the sterically less hindered uh, group fragment will attack the carbonyl compound. However, if we have a substituent here, nevertheless, the attack will play, take place as shown. And the reason that this is happening this way is that it is known that Silicon substituents stabilize a positive charge extremely well. This is the so-called beta effect of trialkylsyl groups. And the reason for this is it is being explained by the same way as you would explain uh, stabilization of carbocations by neighboring groups with the difference that the hyperconjugation, apparently the donation of the sigma carbon silicon bond into the empty pi orbit, into the empty p orbital is extremely efficient, much more efficient then the donation of a sigma CH, for example, if we have additional alkyl groups here, we argued in the same way that a methyl group is stabilizing a cation because sigma CH can donate into the p orbital here. However, the sigma carbon silicon bond is a much better donor and therefore is being able to greatly stabilize such uh, positive charges in beta position. And then in the final step, to complete the reaction, trimethylsilyl cation is eliminated. More or less, you can think of the trimethylsilyl group similar in reactivity like a proton. So stabilization can take place by elimination and therefore this way you're forming the elevated uh, compound. And nevertheless, although this reaction proceeds through such an acyclic open transition state where usually you would not probably have much confidence that the reaction is, can be seroselective, nevertheless as we will see in a moment, the reaction is very often highly diastereoselective in that only the certain adducts are being formed. And we will have to analyze this a little bit further in order to understand why this is. Now, before I do this, let me just point out that there is also an alpha effect. of trialkylsyl groups. Again, this is very useful to remember. And the alpha effect says that a negative charge on the alpha position to a silicon group is also greatly stabilized. So here we have stabilization 
of an carb anion in alpha position. And here we have stabilization of a carbocation in beta position. Now the stabilizing effect on the alpha position has of, of silicon has been explained in two different ways. It has been argued that the silicon atom, let me nevertheless take a little bit more space for this. So it has been argued that a carbanion it has been argued that a carbanion with its negative charge here can be stabilized by the d orbitals of silicon, which are empty. And here you see, of course, that this is a unique feature of the third row elements. The second row elements, like a carbon substituent, could not stabilize uh, this negative charge in the same way, because there are no d orbitals. But here we have the interaction between the lone pair from carbon into the d orbitals of silicon. However, it has been also suggested Calculations have also supported this, that there might be a very low-lying polarizable sigma star CH bond, and so that the lone pair of carbon is actually also able to donate its electron density into the sigma star silicon R bond here. You see that both arguments go into the, into the same direction. This is re reminding us more on the hyperconjugation. So that's, sometimes you also find this as negative hyperconjugation.
Usually we have the donation of the sigma bonds into the into an empty p orbital. That's what we have seen with the carbocations. Here we have donation of a lone pair into an anti-binding sigma star uh, orbital. So both of these explanations and probably both effects take place can explain why the stabilization of the negative charge in alpha position by silicon is very, very effective. So then let's look at the a little bit more in detail on the addition of an electrophile carbonyl groups to an L silane. And the way this is analyzed is that it has been argued that when an electrophile is attacking, or that if, when the L silane is a nucleophile is attacking the electrophile, that that should proceed from a configuration where the developing positive charge here is best stabilized by the silicon group here, making use out of the beta effect here. So the addition should proceed from a conformation where this carbon-silicon bond is oriented in the way that it can stabilize by the beta effect again the positive charge here. And then again, it is argue argued that the electrophile should attack the double bond from the opposite side of that silo substituent. Somehow it resembles the falcon Arn paradigm, right? Where also it was found that the conformation where the, where the largest substituent is orienting orthogonal to the carbonyl group in this case gives the nucleophile the best way. And here we have the situation where once you have concluded that this is a confirmation the reaction should take place, that the electrophile should attack from the sterically least hindered trajectory. Now, however, we would have had two different, uh, two different possibilities here. And that I could have flipped this double bond around. Better way to look at this or to see this is if I draw the enantiomer here. Having this way. And you can see the difference of these two conformations here is that the R group now is clashing with the substituent uh, being seen here. So now we have some kind of an R group interaction with this hydrogen, while here 
the steric interactions are only between the hydrogen atoms. Now this is a conformational feature you find in many L systems and it's important to remember that when you have an L system and for some reason the substituents are oriented that one of the groups is being in the plane with the end of this L fragment. Here the reason was that we have the, this bond line, lining up in order to stabilize the developing charge here. So what we have here is an L system and on position one and on position three the substituents that are in the plane are repulsing each other. And so therefore molecules will try to adopt conformations where this interaction is minimized. This is the so-called 1,3 allylic strain. And this is a driving factor in many acyclic uh, type substrates where stereochemistry is, taking a, uh, is playing a role. It's basically the analogous interaction You find in a chair, in a cyclohexane, where it was argued that the axial position is not favored by large substituents. And it's the same idea because you have these three carbons which force the two axial positions parallel to each other. So this was the one three diaxial interaction. And here, basically, the double bond or the allylic system orienting these three atoms into the plane, or these five atoms into the plane, taking over the same function as we have through the con constraints of the ring here. So then after elimination of the silyl group here, you will obtain this elevated compound. And what is important to recognize is that they are usually formed when you have a substituent on your cell car silyl carbon. They are formed with an E configura configuration here. The E configuration coming because this 1,3 interaction here is minimized, preferring this conformation. And then, as you can see, elimination will create here the trans-oriented double bond. So this explains double bond conformation. This does not explain the syn selectivity. But let's look also at the model which is being put forward here. If we have Our aldehyde group, our aldehyde being activated by the allylic, uh, by the Lewis acid. It has been argued that the attack of the L silane should take place antiperiplanar to the carbonyl group.
And now in principle you have two, op two possibilities. Your L silane can attack from the phase where the methyl group, which was on the terminal end of the L silane, can be away from this R group. Or alternatively, <coughs> it could attack the other way. All of what I have done here is I have flipped almost I have flipped my L silane 180 degrees. And now in this approach, we have an unfavorable Gaussian direction here. While in this approach, the R group of your aldehyde and the methyl group are oriented, again, antiperiplanar. To, e to each other, and therefore this has been argued to be the sterically more favored arrangement here. And if I call this A here, you should see that A is leading So the zin since di diastereomer, and again, I would encourage you to just work once through this, that this geometry indeed leads to this, to the syn diastereomer, and does not lead to the anti-diastereomer. And you can see here in this model that the configuration of this l silane, meaning if this group looks over here to the right, being the E-L silane, or if this group would look over to the left, being the Z-L silane, does not matter. And this is the reason why the E and the Z-L silanes both give the same diastereomers. I will not draw the other the Z uh, geometries on, uh, on the board here. As I say, all what would be different is that this group would move, move over. In the handouts, you have all the possible uh, transition states being drawn, and so you can look at this again and make yourself clear that it does not matter. The geometry in this case, in this model, does not matter, and therefore both E and ZL silanes will lead to the identical will lead to the identical uh, compounds.
Now again, keep in mind what we have just discussed are models which explain selectivities, but very often you obtain mixtures. And so usually it is found that indeed the E configurated L silanes are very, very selective and give you excellent diocereal control. However, the corresponding ZL silence will still give you selectively the, or as the major diastereomer, the syn adduct. However, very often, selectivities are not very good, something like two to one. And that shows you we have, I think we have just convincingly argued in that model for both E and ZL silanes that the syn diastereomer should form. However, you can see here that obviously other transition states must play quite a, quite a role here in order, to, um, in order to do this. And very often the situation is even more complicated. Let me do a small advertisement for chemistry which is going on in my group. We have been looking for a natural product synthesis at the allylation of this aldehyde here. And now in addition to the simple syn anti selectivity you might encounter here, which we do not have since we do not have a substituent in the allylation product we have we are looking at here, but now we have again the situation of an alpha chiral aldehyde here. And so you can analyze this according to the Falconarn rule. You could try to analyze the addition. of this newly formed serial center here, you can make a prediction maybe, and we can discuss this in a tutorial, which one should form. However, with all the predictions you make, the experiment, the reality is that it is uh, only forming in a, in, in a ratio of about uh, three to one. And only when we use a chiral variant of this and again it's been there are many many more L metal reagents than L silanes and uh, or L boranes so only if you use a chiral L titanium reagent here which has, which bears a carbohydrate auxiliary here. Again, being uh, used also quite widely such reagents, such L-titanium reagents in industry. Then we are able to control this steric chemistry with better than 99 to one here. And that is again an example which you should also, when you think about making molecules, should keep in mind, 
we have here a situation of substrate control meaning that the stereo information we come we have from the substrate is controlling the stereo center which we are not newly forming here and if it forms in the wrong way or if it is not very selective there's not a lot of things you can do so substrate control usually is the weaker way to control reagents uh, reactions if you have as we have it here where we have reagent control meaning that only that the chiral information we have here in our L reagent, which however will not transfer into the product. And this way usually you have, if, if the reagent is controlling the outcome of the reaction, thereby overriding the stereochemistry here. This is a much stronger way to control the stereochemistry here. And moreover, by using the other enantiomer, if you have good reagent control, it should also override this and give you the other diastereomer, which is indeed happening. Let me just continue this advertisement. We have converting We have converting We have been converting the compound I've shown here to this natural product which is called aglabine which is a promising farnesyl transferase inhibitor and shows some interesting or some promising activities against various cancer types and the allylation clearly was a key in here you can see that we had close a ring here and that is also done by a very important reaction we will learn about a little bit later. And so by combining these type of organometallic steps here, it's quite easy to very selectively build up uh, compounds of this type. Okay, so with this, I would like to finish for today. We didn't start on the enolates. We will do this on Friday. So I wish you a nice remaining week and then see you on Friday again. Thanks.